Hi everyone. Great lunch, great conversation. So I'm Roddy Hunter and it's my very great pleasure to moderate this final session of papers before we have the, uh, the final plenary discussion. And this uh, panel now, this is about network theories. And I think what's certainly happened today is that we begin to understand the kind of core properties of the kind of practice that we're talking about as being an integration of archival and networking practices in, in various forms. And I think more and more over today we've been hearing more discussion of networks and networking and that's what's going to be our main focus now. In particular we're going to have um, three presentations. We're going to, and three fantastic speakers. Uh, we have John Held Jr., we have Catalin Timar, and we have Clara Kemp Welsh, who are all very eminent practitioners in their field. And actually, respectively, more or less, their presentations are going to cover curating networks, uh, theorizing networks, and researching networks, although I'm sure all of that will integrate as we go along. Um, we're going to get back on schedule. We have three speakers, so we're going to try and stick to 20 minutes and get through this section in an hour. Then we'll give you a coffee break, and then when you come back, we'll do the same thing again. There'll be questions and discussions for the panelists after a break. And then I think that's actually just going to gradually become the broader discussion where we can recap on the whole conference, okay? So that's what's happening today. So first of all, please let me introduce John Held Jr. Um, needs no introduction really in the world of male art and correspondence art. He's an artist and writer based in San Francisco. He's written several books on correspondence art, most recently Archiving Advanced Art, and he's contributed to other really important volumes such as At a Distance, Precursors to Art and Activism on the Internet, which was published by MIT in 2005. He's also organized exhibitions on male art, and his own collections were included in exhibitions such as the recent Snap and Share, transmitting photographs from male art to social networks at San Francisco MoMA. And his own archive is held in collections such as the Getty Research Institute Los Angeles, MoMA New York, and at the Smithsonian Institute Washington. In his talk called Harboring Hidden Histories, Male Art's Reception in the United States, Institutional Archives, He'll discuss how male art is a harbour for hidden histories of Eastern European and South American pre-internet network practices. He'll introduce some recent exhibitions in museums to explore how male art is collected and exhibited in museums and reflect on how artworks previously considered marginal and held in mainly private archives are now slowly absorbed into mainstream art histories. It's also his first returning visit to Budapest since goodness knows when, many, many years ago. So welcome John Hill Jr. Thank you very much. It's been a great two days. I'm very pleased to be part of it. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to start telling you how I got involved in male art. Um, I was a, a library student uh, science student uh, at Syracuse University <clears throat> and uh, started working in public libraries and uh, uh, I, in, I took a break from the library. Uh, I was working in upstate New York and uh, I went to Europe for the first time in 1976 and I was thinking I was an emerging artist and everything so I was going to go to the south of France and you know be a a fake modernist artist or something. And I was there for two days and got very bored and just went all over Europe. And I ended up in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Amsterdam, Holland, where I wandered into a rubber stamp store called Posthumus. And uh, they had these visual rubber stamps and I'd really never had seen that before. And I thought, oh, this is a quick way to do art. This is, this is good. So I bought some, and I was going to give them to my children when I got home, but when I got home, I said, I, I'm going to use them myself. So I started using the rubber stamps in my artwork, and I wrote back to the uh, owner of Posthumous, uh, Mr. Vanderplatz, who had a royal charter for rubber stamps in, in Holland, because during World War II, the Nazis were using the company to make up rubber stamps. 
and uh, for you know, various purposes, but the rubber stamp company would make duplicate rubber stamps and give them to the resistance. So after the war, the queen uh, gave the company uh, a royal charter. But in the store, they had rubber stamps, but they were also selling sweets and candies and things like that, which really didn't make any sense to me. I, was, I went home and started researching how um, artists were using rubber stamps. And finally, one day, I saw uh, an article in the New York Times about a rubber stamp company in uh, Rhode Island uh, and uh, called Bizarro. And I wrote to them and I said, do you know of any other artists using rubber stamps? And they wrote back and said, well, there's this movement called mail art. And if you're interested in it, you should get in touch with them. And the first person you should contact is Ray Johnson. And the other person you should contact is E.M. Plunkett. And E.M. Plunkett gave the name to Ray Johnson's uh, mail art activities in 1962 called the New York Correspondence School of Art. So I wrote to both of them, and they both wrote back immediately, and I formed a, a kind of bond with Johnson because as well as working uh, at the public library, I was doing some archive work at uh, a, uh, an historic uh, uh, utopian religious community called Oneida Community. And so it had me thinking about intentional communities. And Ray Johnson was very interested in this as well. I mean, most of his work seemed very Dadaistic and playful, but he was a very serious guy uh, who went to Black Mountain College, uh, which was this experimental art school in the late 1950s with Robert Rauschenberg, Cy Twomley, John Cage, Mertz Cunningham, and I could go on and on with the uh, the, the celebrity artists that came out of that school. Most of them went into commercial art, but uh, Johnson was a kind of a shy guy, so he started distributing his art through the mail and everything. So uh, I got in touch with Mr. Vanderplatz again, said, is all these artists using rubber stamps, you should have a gallery, you know. And at the same time, Ulysses Carrion, uh, had his other books and so, and he had a rubber stamp show that um, uh, Mr. Vanderplatz uh, went to. So um, he invited me to come over and uh, to be the first person in this gallery, Sample Platz. And uh, I went over for two weeks and I spent most of my time with uh, Ulysses Carrion uh, at other books and so. And it, he was really, fundamental to my development as a male artist because instead of the kind of playful data, you know, uh, networking that was going on in the United States, he took it a lot more seriously and saw male art as a cultural strategy. And that was very important to me. So I, I was very lucky in my very formative years when I was still in my 20s to meet a great artist like Ray Johnson and Ulysses Carrion. But when I got back home, I saw, I saw this was 1976, I uh, saw an article in a magazine about this woman, Jean Brown. And the, the uh, uh, magazine read in part, it is always the marginal she stresses, such manifestations as concrete poetry, rubber stamp art, the vagaries of video. She is after elusive connections, the small gaps that relate the recent past to the less publicized present day directions. Other borderline movements she considers extensions of data and also perhaps fluxes are male art and letterism. So I looked her up, and uh, she didn't live too far from me. I was in New York, upstate New York. She was in Massachusetts. It was about a two-hour drive. And I started going there all the time, and she would put me up uh, overnight uh, to stay with her, and I would go through the archive. The archive uh, that she had was very unusual because she lived in a Shaker seed house. Now, the Shakers were a religious community. Uh, in upstate New York, but they were very famous for their 
very functional, plain furniture. And uh, uh, this, uh, there were Shaker communities, but uh, this one had broken up, so she moved this, their seed house to her property, and that became her home. And Machunas built an archive for her uh, in the style of Shaker furniture on, on the second floor of her house. Eventually, Jean was growing older and everything, and something had to be done with the archive. It was a huge archive because in the 1950s, she was um, uh, collecting with her, her, her husband, Leonard, uh, data and surrealistic ephemera. Not the artworks themselves, but the letters that they had written, the posters, the periodicals, uh, the multiples, etc. So, uh, the Getty was very interested in her collection, but they didn't want the Fluxus stuff because at the time they only collected up till 1945. So they had to get a special dispensation from uh, the, the board of the Getty to collect this material that was passed 1945. And Marsha Reed, who is uh, the librarian who took this in, uh, wrote about what happened when uh, they first received the collection. She says, as we unpacked the Jean Brown's notable Fluxus collections, our director just happened to swing by. He took one look at the boxes, books, and objects and said, what is this shit? I had never heard an explicative from him and we quickly closed up the shelves. Looking back, as I became familiar with Dieter Ross's books, which reference substances best managed by toilets, he may have been right. So the, the unfortunate thing is that they have this incredible Fluxus collection of Jean Browns, and they have made it available to scholars, and uh, you know, there's key, uh, some of the things online, but they've never shown it at all. But I'm very happy to say that I'm still in communication with Gene Brown's uh, son, Robert, and he's told me that they're planning a big exhibition of her, of her work uh, with a big uh, catalog uh, to, uh, to accompany it. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that very much. So that kind of opened the floodgates uh, for Fluxus entering libraries in, in the United States. But it took another person. Uh, here, let me show you one thing. I'm sorry. Um, uh, ba, 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 ba. The pictures. You want the pictures? Yeah. Uh, this one here. Yep. And so this is Jean Brown in the archive, and as I say, it's a very, there just pulls on the drawers and you open it up and there it is, but, and there was a big uh, wooden table also there. Uh, let me see. Um, there's some other views of her. This, with the Gerlovens. This was uh, an early mail art project of mine where I did a diary of correspondence. And that's the uh, upper portion is, uh, that map is uh, her stationary de uh, design by George Machunas. And that's Jean on the left being interviewed and the young Jean Hill Jr. there <laughs> on, on the right. And this was a rubber stamp that I made for her after Don and Surrealism as Jean Brown. And that's the article that I saw uh, that had the quote. And again, that's the uh, uh, envelope, the back of the envelope designed by Machunas. And this is uh, the Getty material. And that's Jean. So, uh, let me see. The other person, uh, yeah. Thank you. Mm, scroll down. Great, thank you. 
Okay. So genes um, oh, kind of opened the floodgates for fluxes being accepted in, in libraries in the United States. Uh, but it was left to this person, Stephen Lieber, uh, who is an art dealer, uh, <clears throat> uh, to, uh, uh, a, a prop, uh, to sell a collection to the Walker Art Center. Um, and then they had the first major show of Fluxus in the United States called In the Spirit of Fluxus in 1992. Um, I, I would like to read to you what Lieber said when he first um, found out about Fluxus. I bought a collection in the late 80s that came from an artist, Jeff Berner, who was associated with Fluxus. He had a flux shop. I'm not sure how fu functional it was. What I mean is, I'm not sure it was a shop. Actually, it wasn't a shop. <clears throat> what he did was uh, try to place flux boxes in head shops on Haight-Ashbury, which was in, in 1968, which is kind of weird. Granted, not that many fluxus editions were sold between 1961 and 1978. So this guy had multiple copies of this or that edition. In, in addition, his, uh, this collection also had a great deal of material concerning visual poetry, concrete poetry, and a certain amount of beat and countercultural material from the 60s. <clears throat> in the process of making sense of what this collection was, I mean, it's a bit of an exaggeration to call it a collection. It was 21 boxes of material without an index or no order just 21 boxes of crap. And I think I spent approximately a year with a colleague trying to make sense of it. In the process, it became clear to me that what was most exciting was not the most obvious material, not the things that uh, I actually went to buy, which was primarily the Fluxus material. It was the other things for Fluxus events or festivals. There wasn't necessarily a thing that would have come out of the exhibition. You didn't buy a painting, you showed up, saw what went on, and in time, what becomes the collectible aspect of it is the flyer, the poster, the relic, the printed material that was generated from these events. So I guess my interest in artist ephemera specifically, and art ephemera in general, grows out of that inquiry. When uh, Matunis was dying, uh, he, he came up to uh, Massachusetts. He, uh, he was in New York, and uh, he was loan sharking. He was getting illegal loans from the mafia to settle Soho as an artist community. And um, at the same time that the mafia was after him, the attorney general from New York State was after him because he was breaking zoning laws to form these communities. So he had his eye put out by the, the mafia, and you'll see sometimes he has a, an eye patch on his eye. So after that incident, he went up to live near Gene Brown in Massachusetts, uh, in Great Barrington, and uh, he, he uh, you know, spent the last couple of years of his life up there. He wanted to give his collection to Gene Brown, but Gene Brown kind of wanted to deny that he was dying, and so she said no. So instead, um, he gave the collection to Barbara Moore and John Hendricks, who had a, a little shop in New York, and uh, they were selling Fluxus materials. This is 1978 or so, very, very cheaply. And one day, Gilbert Silverman came into the uh, store and said, I'll take everything. You know, and I'll take you too to John Hendricks. And that's how the Fluxus Codex came into being. Well, recently, um, the, uh, uh, the Silverman Collection went to MoMA in New York, and uh, there was a woman, um, Julia Friedman, who started working on the collection. I, I wanted to read to you what she had to say about that. Maybe I could get a, uh, here. These are some other things about Lieber, by the way. 
It's a catalog he put out. Well, anyway, I, I'm having a little trouble finding this, so I'll, I'll just wrap it up, kind of. That she was talking about, she didn't know what was artworks and what was ephemera, and that was the whole point. I mean, the, the things just were so confused. I, I mean, you know, the Getty guy is saying it's shit, Lieber is saying, you know, what is it? You know, it's very hard for, you know, archivists to, where to place this? Should it go into the museum? Should it go into the library? And I'm still having the same trouble with, with mail art. Now, the thing about mail art, it kind of followed the, the same process of fluxes. And it, the surprising thing is that some of the top uh, archives in the, in the United States um, are collecting way before anybody else. So the biggest collections of, of, mail, uh, of fluxes are in, or mail art are in the Archives of American Art, uh, in the Getty. I've sold them collections of, uh, I think I sold them 2,000 mail art exhibition catalogs, but they have other things as well at the Getty relating to mail art. And um, MoMA New York has a lot of things too, thanks to Clive Philpot. Uh, who is an early uh, a, a library in there? Uh, so the main uh, libraries uh, in the in the United States are, you know, have very good collections of male art, but it's it hasn't gone into the museums yet. There's really been no exhibition of male art, you know, in a major museum in the United United States. Uh, recently, though, last year. San Francisco Public Library had a, uh, a show called uh, Snap and Share, Transmitting Photographs from Mail Art to Social Networks. And they heard that I had a big mail art collection, so they came to me and I put together like 2,000 photographic works for them to choose by from like 150 artists from 30 countries. And they chose 88 items to show. What they did was, they built like a big picture window with two panes of glass and they put the mail art you know, in between the, the glass so you could view it from the front and then from the back as well. And it, the curator is an amazing person, Clement Chirot. He uh, was a photographic uh, curator at the Pompidou and uh, he went to San Francisco and just last week he was hired to be the curator of photography uh, at New York MoMA. So um, um, I'll wrap it up, but it, 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 it's interesting because every, it, it got incredible reviews and uh, in the, it had a full uh, review in the uh, Sunday New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, in the Washington Post, in Art in America magazine, but everywhere they always put male art in quotes or so-called male art. I mean, I mean, you know, it's like maybe it's art, maybe it's not, I don't know. And the thing is they just bought the collection from me, but instead of putting it in the museum, they put it in the library. So, you know, it's really the same process uh, that's, that went on with Flux is the same thing is happening with mail art now. Uh, it, it's uh, being uh, collected by librarians, but slowly but surely museum uh, curators are starting to go to the library to take the material be and, and show it. This is happening in MoMA as well as SFMOMA. Thank you, appreciate you.